Owing to past neglect in the face of the plainest warnings, we have entered upon a period of danger. The era of procrastination, of half measures, of soothing and baffling expediences and delays is coming to a close. In its place, we are entering a period of consequences. Winston Churchill, 1936. Today, our situation is even more serious, more global, and longer lasting. I'll mention just two warnings, surprising perhaps because of their origins. In 2004, a, a Pentagon study concluded that climate change, the climate crisis, is likely to lead to, quote, disruption and conflict becoming endemic features of life. And in 2009, a think tank advising the UK Ministry of Defense warned of world of wars, the size of the two world wars lasting for centuries if we do not restrict climate chaos. We are now in a vicious circle. We are on a collision course with our own future. We're endlessly producing non-sustainable energy to produce goods and machines which raise the expectations and the demand for more products requiring more energy, etc., etc. How did we get into this mess? In the face of the plainest warnings, to use Church's words. For the Club of Rome report, came out almost 40 years ago, derided at the time, its business as usual scenario has been overwhelmingly confirmed since then. A few years later, the Global 2000 report com commissioned by President Carter called for drastic action. And almost 20 years ago in Rio, governments recognized what was, it, what was at stake and what was required, unanimously endorsing the remarkable Agenda 21 plan of action. A briefing book endorsed by the Earth Summit chair, Maurice Strong, spelled out the extent of the challenge. Quote, Effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action be integrated into individual and collective decision-making at every level, end quote. In 1994, 1,500 of the world's top scientists warned that, quote, we are fast approaching many of the Earth's limits. Current economic practices that damage the environment risk that vital global systems would be damaged beyond repair, end quote. And in 2005, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, an unprecedented four-year worldwide expert study, concluded that nearly two-thirds of the services provided by nature to humankind are found to be in decline worldwide. So why have we not renewed our world already? Because we are imprisoned by the ruling economic dogmatism and ideology. As the Financial Times columnist Martin Wolf wrote in 2008, if there are indeed limits to growth, then the political underpinnings of our society collapse. For example, issues of global equity can no longer be postponed but with promises of future growth taking care of them. So therefore, from our ruler's point of view, what must not be, cannot be. Of course, some limits can be, have always been overcome. Natural scientists, however, call this the fallacy of the successful first step, which they sometimes find in their experiments. We've also managed to postpone limits for 40 years by economic globalization, i.e. by growing into the economic and ecological space of other countries, ensuring that when limits finally do hit, they will be all-pervasive, the so-called global peak everything. But our politicians are still advised by economists to tell them that all this does not really matter because GDP will continue to grow. Professor Thomas Schelling, a Nobel uh, Foundation laureate in economics, argues that um, climate change will only really affect agriculture. But agriculture in the United States only makes up about 3% of GDP. So even if that collapses, it falls by 50%, that's just 1% to 2% of GDP. But in the meantime, people will have become much richer. So, I'll, you know, this is, I think, the really scary thing. Our decision makers are actually advised by people and trust people who literally believe that we can eat money. That as long as we continue producing enough iPods and derivatives, it doesn't matter, for example, if agriculture collapses. 
Of course, in this country a few years ago, there was a reality check when a British environmentalist, uh, Sir Crispin Tekel, was asked by uh, Swiss financiers uh, to uh, call together a symposium about the um, consequence of peak oil. And at the end of it, he told me, these financiers said, but, you know, if peak oil is, is true, then, you know, we are lost because uh, 70 to 80 percent of the values of all our investment funds is based on the expectations of future capital flows. And future capital flows depend on, among other things, primarily cheap energy. I should perhaps add a word here in this whole, to this, regarding this whole debate about limits to growth and you know, GDP. The problem is not that GDP will suddenly fall. I mean, GDP percentages you can, you can manipulate by bringing activities into the market, which before were outside the market and therefore not measured in monetary terms. That is not the problem. The problem is that it becomes an increasingly irrelevant measure of human well-being. Many argue it already is that, but that will become more and more so because it will increasingly measure repairing mechanisms and um, damage control mechanisms in our struggle to renew our world or just keep it from collapsing. I mean, just to give you one practical example, the, the, the builders, the construction workers, and the, the materials, the cement, which is being needed to build walls against rising sea levels is not available to build houses and flats for the next generation. These are the real limits and the real struggles we're going to face. So if we want to renew our world in time, we need to create new alliances and learn from our opponents who support institutions, who support political action, who fund long term, while we are often involved with helping extinguishing the latest fire. That it's not going to be enough, and every delay will make it much harder. I saw um, last week that the head of the UNFCC, Christiana Figueres, estimates that every year's delay in tackling climate chaos will, rise, uh, will increase the cost by about $1 trillion. But of course, it's even more important in real-world terms. You know, the climate chaos rushing towards us will make everything else, combating poverty, uh, security, global security, preserving water resources, etc., will make everything else much harder, will turn possibly reversible regional problems and challenges into unmanageable worldwide disasters. And I recommend you a key book about that by an Australian Paul Gilding called The Great Disruption, about what is actually coming towards us. Interesting enough, the, the European subtitle to that book is How the Climate Crisis Will Transform the Global economy. The American one is more down to earth. Why the climate crisis will bring on an end of shopping and the birth of a new world. <laughs> we need to accept that increasingly the real power now lies with nature. No decisions by the market or by political majorities or even dictators can alter natural laws of physics, chemistry, biology or mathematics. You cannot negotiate rescue packages or debt forgiveness with melting glaciers, spreading deserts, or shrinking resource bases. So is there still time to renew our world? Well, there's of course no guarantee. And the German philosopher of hope, Ernst Bloch, once wrote that the price of human freedom is the risk that the great historical moment will encounter too small a humanity, one not up to the challenge. That risk we have. But the evidence shows that it is still possible to renew our world if we act now. Another wasted decade will be too much, most probably. If you look at Mark Leiner's book, who's now advising the Maldives president, book Six Degrees, where he looks at what happens when temperatures rises towards, rises towards increasing by six degrees centigrade, and then basically we can say that we are lost. I mean, we'll have a a world full of firestorms, a rising methane from the ocean, self-igniting, a world, according to a number of expert calculations, which he cites, habitable for less than 10% of its current population. So what is now required? Of course, best practices as citizens, as consumers, as producers, are very important. We are here in a rich country, above average uh, parts of the problem, and therefore changes we do in our personal and professional lives will become above average part of the solution. And that's you know, why I set up over 30 years ago the Right Livelihood Awards, the so-called Alternative Nobel Prizes, which on honor such, self, such best practices, such early solutions um, with this award given out in the Swedish parliament. But I realized that it's not enough. It will still be too little too late. These 
best practices will not become the new mainstream, which is what is required in time, without the necessary policy framework support. Policies, laws, regula regulatory frameworks, institutions determine the way we live, they determine how markets operate, they determine in which direction technologies develop by setting the right incentives and disincentives. So we need to engage actively in politics to make sure we have the right policies, the right incentives and disincentives. You know, in ancient Athens, the person who, ref who was engaged in public political life was known as a politus. The one who refused to get engaged was known as an idiotus. But of course, today, many people think, you know, you're an idiot to go into politics. But I think we have really to reverse this. We have real to realize, for example, that the institutions we create send signals about how we want our future to be. In 1945, they didn't just revive the League of Nations, they created the UN. Today, we have just been involved, the World Future Council, in working very hard to promote a new international institution, which now exists with almost 150 member governments to promote renewable energy, the International Renewable Energy Agency. The World Future Council works to get countries and international, on the international level also to introduce ombudsman, parliamentary ombudsman at the national level to represent the interests of future generations when decisions are taken. And my, my World Future Council colleague, the director of our work on future justice, Dr. Maya Goebel, is here to speak about um, this campaign for a future generations ombudsman. And we are also working to reform existing institutions. We looked at how IMF special drawing rights, this money which the IMF can create when the member countries agree, and which of course they created in large uh, amounts uh, to save the banks, how that can be created to save the climate by overcoming the so-called funding deadlock. You know, the rich countries uh, find it politically impossible to come up with the money and transfer it to the poor where most of these projects are, are needed or even to fund enough renewable energy in their own countries. The poor countries refuse, understandably, to get further into debt to deal with a problem which they haven't caused. And so we have looked at how these SDRs can be produced as new money um, uh, and uh, debt-free money, interest-free money, non-inflationary, by only funding new performance. Uh, this is um, slightly complicated, but it is, we have looked at this in great detail and found that uh, there is now interest. I had a meeting at, uh, in, in France in, in, uh, with government representatives about this yesterday. So uh, there are ways we can use existing institutions, but also we need to you know, build new institutions. We may need to appoint sort of plenty potential representatives. Governments need to give them the mandate to negotiate a climate agreement. Is something like that feasible? Well, that's the way the, the European Union actually and the solved its late problems before it was founded. Every member of government appointed a high level official and they was met, sent off to a castle in France and told to meet together until they had reached, uh, reached agreement. The World Future Council promotes best policies. We started with renewable energy because um, we see this as the greatest, uh, the greatest challenge. We looked at the most effective policy uh, to promote renewable energy to increase the uptake. Wherever there is a grid, it's so-called feed-in tariffs, which we have helped to spread and introduce in a number of countries where they weren't before. Where there is no grid, um, it's um, probably, in our, in our opinion, the sort of freestanding solar home systems, a model developed in Bangladesh, promote, uh, funded by microcredits, which we are now working to spread in Africa. So why is renewable energy so absolutely key? Because of the opportunity costs of not using it. If we don't maximize renewable energy use, We've lost it. That's why any cost comparison between it and non-renewables and fossil fuels is absurd. The oil you've burned is gone. The solar energy you didn't use is gone. So they're completely opposite. The sunshine of today you cannot harness anymore tomorrow. We are currently looking into the lost opportunity costs, the enormous daily destruction of natural capital of not using renewables to the maximum extent technologically and humanly um, humanly feasible. Of course, a renewable world is not just about energy. It's about realizing that our world is no longer, no longer has an out there. Uh, the risk uh, 
investigator Professor Beck says globalization means the end of the other. You know, you, we can no longer afford to treat our world as a disposable world. A renewable world requires, therefore, a cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach, to use the terms of the German-American couple Michael Braungart and William McDonough. Um, we need to make our cities, our resource uses, our product change, our production change, and our whole ways of life into circular metabolisms, ensuring that we live not on capital but on income as trustees. And one pro project we have suggested is to, to put global commons, various global commons into a trust with trustees responsible to charge the fees of those who use and misuse it. And these fees could then become a sort of citizens, global citizens income so that people are aware that, you know, when somebody is polluting the global commons, the oceans, for example, then it's actually, they, there's, they are being deprived. They are being impoverished by these, by people who are able to make profits at the expense of the environment and, and of the future. So is this transition we are talking about possible? Uh, well, yes, there are many signs that it is. You know, the current global energy demand can be covered over four, four times over by renewable energy with current technologies. Various studies, including by PricewaterhouseCoopers and McKinsey, show that it's possible to have 100% en renewable energy um, that all energy use becomes renewable within the next decades. The problems are lacks of political will. They are not technological. Just a couple of examples. In Spain, heat storage now enables solar energy to work at night on a commercial basis. In Portugal, the grid electricity percentage coming from renew renewables went up from 15 to 45% in five years. And this is in a world where the disincentives are still massive, where fossil fuels still receive 12 times as much subsidies as renewable energy does. The question is not, can we renew the world? Because we really have no choice. As Churchill once said, it's not enough to do your best. You have to do what is necessary. And for those who will then sit and think, oh, well, you know, all this is very nice, but of course China will go on like before. Well, I can assure you China does not go on like before. China is aware that they cannot go on like before. This is not a question of choice. Chinese CO2 emissions alone will make the country uninhabitable if they do not change. And they are very much aware of that. Uh, Chandra Nair's latest book, Consumptionomics, Chandra Nair runs the Global Institute for Tomorrow in, in Hong Kong, uh, shows very clearly that the Chinese development model has to become, has to be very different from the Western one, has to be very much uh, less resource intensive if it is going to work at all. And uh, the, the Chinese leadership is very aware of this. So the last question, of course, is, well, you know, can we do it in time? And this is, is again, you know, as I said before, a question of leadership. In 1941, it was regarded as um, impossible to produce the number of ships and, and, um, um, and airplanes, which were a real small number in 1943, to quote Al Gore. It took the threat of fascism, but it took the leadership of Franklin Roosevelt to convince the US to produce much more than was thought possible. Of course, it's easy to get lost in negativity, but a re renewable world is not just about you know, doing with less. Certain things, yes, you know, there are going to be limits. You know, can we afford as much meat production and consumption as currently in a world where it takes 15,000 liters of water to produce one kilogram of veal and water shortages is probably the most serious immediate problem we are facing? No, of course not. So we are going to have to, have to change and it is going to affect, uh, affect standards. But it is also about healing and enjoying our earth. Our unique responsibility is also a unique opportunity for entrepreneurs, of course, but for all citizens. And uh, the previous speaker reminded me of my favorite Viktor Frankl quote. Sometimes the right thing to do is only 55% right, but you still have to do it. I will close with an, another quote from a practical visionary, the great inventor Thomas Edison who wrote in 1920 already, 
We are like tenant farmers chopping down the fence around our house for fuel when we should be using nature's inexhaustible sources of energy, sun, wind, and tide. I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. Thank you very much.